strike of a light bulb. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tyco. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the vapors of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. All right, welcome once again to Ratchet and Clank Up Your Arsenal Developer Commentary. I am Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And today we have a very special guest. So very special. And uh, he was also a programmer on Ratchet and Clank 3. I believe it was the first game you worked on as a video game developer. Uh, Anthony Moo Yu. Let's give it up for Anthony Moo Yu. Woo! Hello there. Go Moo! Howdy, guys. <laughs> And Moo is actually joining us from across the ocean uh, to help us record a couple episodes and add a little bit of uh, anger and spite to the commentary. I'm nothing but smiles and sunshine nowadays. <laughs> so is this, a, is this a drastic change for you, Moo? Are you okay with that? Yeah, I don't know. It's not too bad. I've, I've, I've chilled out a bit, a, a little bit less angry, depending <laughs> on what environment I'm in. We'll see how it goes. Well, that's good to hear. So I guess we're going to play a, a Quark vid comic to start with. Uh, Moo, do you have anything to say about Quark Vid Comics? No, I don't really remember a whole lot. I'm, I don't remember a whole lot about this game, to be honest. Um, I probably remember doing a lot more than I actually did. That's okay. That's what we do, too. So, uh, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think this is where Captain Quark forms the Q-Force. Possibly. I don't, we have to talk really quick about what an amazing style these cutscenes were. <laughs> the, the Quark's drawings. Yeah. I'm not... I don't remember whose idea it was. Uh, I think it was Greg, wasn't it? Or was it somebody else? Yeah, I don't know. That's that's all I got. But I love the, the drawings that we had here whenever Quark has to describe his plans. Because he did it in the first game, too, I think. I don't recall at all. I just remember seeing these and thinking it was unbelievable and incredible and amazing. Yeah, I just love the idea that we hire, you know, top-rate illustrators and artists to generate hand-drawn kids' drawings. <laughs> oh, so uh, we do have the, uh, the, uh, crap, the commentary, the them talking to each other part here. Do you want to do that now or wait? Uh, we can talk about it now. Uh, yeah, while well, you just head on over to the, uh, to the Quark Good comic. Okay. I remember, because we had, um... The, we talked about Greg in the last podcast about the guy who did all the breakables and sort of brought the game up to another level in terms of smashing the environments out. Yeah. And he came back for uh, this project for another internship. And so we gave him a whole bunch of new tasks or whatever. And one of the things that we had going on here in the Stark of Phoenix was all those characters on the bridge just sitting there talking to each other. And from what I recall, and I probably have a bias opinion about this sort of thing is that the designers really wanted that to be as realistic and immersive as possible uh visceral as possible i'm sorry visceral is the key word i think at this point yeah it was either visceral or emergent i forget what the key word of the year was right so uh what they really wanted was lip syncing to all the dialogue that they spoke while they were on the bridge and the animators were like, no, that's not happening. You're crazy if you think we're going to do lip sync animations for all these guys. But undeterred, if the animators were reluctant to do lip syncing animation, they went to Greg and like, Greg, you could do lip syncing programmatically, can't you? <laughs> like, it should be easy to just grab the bones and the lips and move them around. And they brought like a bunch of like, uh, like like some animator reference stuff about the common mouth shapes that you make while talking. They're like, there's only like 10 mouth shapes. You can totally do this easily. <laughs> what could and possibly it, go wrong? Right. And every, every programmer who heard this idea was like, you're crazy. There is no possible way we can do programmatic lip sync animations on all these characters. Are you insane? But I remember it was brought up a couple of times of like, how hard could it be to do this? And the answer is, of course, incredibly, massively, impossibly hard to do. But Greg but, did it. No, uh, well, no, they have these flapping animations that they do that aren't lip synced at all. Oh, they just okay. have these random talking animations. But they didn't want to do random talking animations. 
They wanted to be perfectly synced to the dialogue, which was never going to happen. It, which is especially good because all of the characters are facing away and you can't actually see their lips. Right, yeah. I mean, I guess the other trouble we kind of had is that we had Resistance going on at the same time. So everyone's thinking next gen and sort of got their head, you know, half, di half of the day in Resistance next gen technology and then has to come back to Ratchet and sort of, you know, it's tough to leave that stuff behind. Exactly. And that, I mean, that was definitely a big problem where everybody was like, oh, you know, we're doing this on Resistance. Why can't we just port over some of that technology onto Ratchet? And it's kind of like, it really doesn't work that way, guys. <laughs> like, the, thing we're, the stuff we're doing on Resistance is specifically stuff we cannot do on the PS2, by and large. That's why we're doing it on Resistance. Although, and, and by and large, at that stage, we probably couldn't have done it on the PS3 either. We are just sort yeah. of dealing with the theoretical what we thought the PS3 could potentially one day be. Oh, do you remember right. Do you remember at the beginning of the PS3, we were all like, oh, we don't need normal maps, we can just model them all with polygons and... PS3 will be able to handle everything and it'll look real. Yeah, one of my favorite th moments in the development of Resistance before we had any hardware specs whatsoever was when all the Resistance programmers requested 8 gigs of memory because they're like, well, we need to be able to simulate the environment. <laughs> so we're going to be developing it. But, uh, uh, re but we're not talking about Resistance. We're talking about Ratchet. That's right. We're talking about... The we're talking about the Quark vid comics more specifically. Indeed, and uh, we complained a lot about them last time. Uh, do you have anything new to say about them? Uh, well, I mean, again, I didn't really work on these. So my experience on these was mostly on the outside looking in. And, I mean, you're the one that had the most, you know, hands-on experience with how these were going. So, I mean, all I know is that there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of complaints that things weren't turning out the way that people had hoped that they would. Uh, but I don't know any of the specifics about what was actually going on behind the scenes in the development of this. Uh, yeah, you know what? We covered that pretty well last time, so maybe we yeah. should just keep talking about Moo's experience with the PlayStation 3. Oh, I, I didn't have much experience. <laughs> we could talk a little bit more about just Moo's general experience, because this was the first thing that you worked on. Yeah, absolutely. So this was my... This was my first job straight out of school. You know, I finished my last final on a Friday and started at Insomniac on a Monday. I think during finals week, um, they got back to me and interviewed me and all that kind of stuff. And I just started three or four days later. Wow, really? So you were out for interviews before you were out of school? Yeah, I basically, I sent out um, a bunch of resumes maybe two weeks before I graduated. Um, or I, before I had my finals. And yeah, they got back to me within like two or three hours and set up a bunch of interviews. And I came down and interviewed and started the following Monday. Wow. And, uh, and then you ended up getting sat next to Tony. That must have sucked. Uh, uh, we didn't sit next to each other right away, I don't think. Oh, yeah? No. I think, I think at the beginning it was like a relatively empty area with uh, Ricardo and Carl Glaive. Um, and then Tony and Jared moved into our area. And, and then the fun the began. hilarity ensued. <laughs> The hilarity for everyone, but poor Ricardo. <laughs> poor, poor Ricardo. Like, uh, Carl didn't have much of a fun time with it either. I mean, we were kind of obnoxious to everybody in that area. Yeah, uh, everyone in the office, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that's true. But you learned an important lesson about family, and... Uh, uh, so, help me out here. <laughs> On working together and what it's really like to belong to something. Aww. <laughs> So you also have an interesting perspective that we hadn't touched on before, in that you actually played the Ratchet and Clank games before you started at Insomnia. Yep, absolutely. Um, Ratchet 2 had come out just after I interviewed, or maybe slightly before. Um, so I hadn't played Ratchet 2 yet, but I played the shit out of Ratchet 1. Um, and yeah, it was just incredible, just sort of how immersive it was and that kind of stuff, and it just sort of put Insomniac on my list of, you know, studios I really want to work at. Never did I actually think they would hire me. That's sort of the crazy part. Uh, you know what? Actually, that's a, a... I'll bet that a lot of people listening probably want to hear sort of about what it takes to get into the industry. Maybe if you told them a little bit about sort of what the, pro the process of getting in was like. Yeah, for me it was kind of weird. Um, I sort of got a few lucky breaks. I, I always played loads and loads of video games when I was younger. I loved playing video games, but you know I never really thought I could make them professionally. 
Um, and I happened to run into a guy at school who was working for an uh, internet startup. It was 2001, I think. Internet startup doing web games and stuff like that. Uh, and he had to find an intern. And I think the deal he made with me was that if I would be the intern for the summer, then he would let me borrow his E3 pass for a day. <laughs> um, so I did web games for a summer, and then he moved to a studio in Camarillo called Kush, and they made sports games. And so I did, I think, all the UI for sports games for for one summer. So I think I probably did, you know, somewhere around 80 different screens in three months. Was that riveting and really super fun? Uh, it was it was crazy to see what it's actually like. Like, I never thought to apply to a video games company because it just seemed like it'd be too complicated. There'd be no role for me. I didn't understand how anything worked. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of got an inside look of like, wow, it's just, it's just code. Like, it's just, you know, programming like these weird CS projects I'm doing. Um, written in a very, very different way, but it is still just code. So uh, uh, it looks like the next level is the underwater hideout, which is one of my levels. All right, then we'll jump right into it. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to cut this episode off now. But when we come back for the next episode, we'll have more with Anthony Mu Yu uh, on the commentary. So for Rats and Clank, uh, up your arsenal developer commentary. I'm Anthony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And our guest today is... Mu Yu. And we'll check you next... Oh, God, not again. Tony, finish it. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> All right. From now on, I, I'm not going to sign off. You sign off.